Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, Burkitt's seminar on the planning white paper, especially designed for uh, local government, local authorities, and in particular local planning authorities. Uh, my name is Tom Newcomb, and I'm head of planning and environmental at, uh, at Burkitt's. Um, we do uh, quite a lot of work for uh, local planning authorities, but also for the private sector as well. And we're a team of uh, 16 specialists in planning and environmental law. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to say today that uh, we've got four speakers for you. Uh, myself, I'm gonna do a bit of introduction and then chair the at the end and uh, then Deborah Sharples who is my co-partner in the team um, and Stephen Bell who's a senior associate and then I'm really pleased to say that we're joined by William Upton QC from Six Pump Court um, who is a multi-award winning barrister uh, reasonably recently taken silk and uh, an expert in all things planning and environmental so that's really good news for us. Um, there's lots of you on the call today and um, thank you ever so much for joining and thank you to those of you who submitted your questions in advance. Um, we have a function with this webinar system which allows you to raise questions during the course of the presentations um, and so I would really encourage you to do that. I'll be able to ask our panelists, uh, Stephen, Deborah and William, um, some questions at the end. So please do ask, ask anything that pops into your mind, no matter how ridiculous it might seem. I'll, I'll make sure that the questions are anonymous. Um, and at the end of the day, this is uh, free legal advice for you all. So uh, take advantage of the questions as best you can. So um, we're going to have an update on uh, what is going on currently in the planning system, and that includes two pieces of consultation. The first one um, is called changes to the current planning system. Um, there's a relatively tight deadline for this now, so your, um, your representations need to be submitted by the 1st of October 2020. And then the second one is the white paper itself, which is entitled Planning for the Future. There's a little bit longer for that, so you've got until the uh, 29th of October in order to uh, submit your representations. And I suppose if there's one thing to take away from this presentation this morning is that we would definitely urge you to take the time to read both of these documents if you haven't already, and I'm sure you have, uh, and um, make your comments known. As you can imagine, there'll be plenty in the development industry that will be making lots of comments. And what we don't want, um, both, as a, both as a planning team at Burkitt's, but also uh, as a nation, is to have it too one-sided. So we want, we want representations from all sides on this. So what about uh, consultation in planning? Well, if someone had have asked me back in, say, April or May, what one might expect for uh, predictions for an August 2020 government consultation on planning, you might expect some of these words to feature. So austerity, the environment, climate change emergency, homelessness, affordable housing, the levelling up agenda, which was a, obviously a particularly big focus uh, of the current government's uh, election campaign, uh, affordable housing, um, uh, Black Lives Matter, Brexit, of course, and then pandemics, and obviously in particular COVID-19. Um, you might also expect, of course, uh, building more houses and home ownership to feature heavily. Now, there's a reason why those two are shown red on this slide, uh, and the reason is quite simple: that the rest of the uh, the rest of the words on that slide barely feature at all in any of these two documents, whereas the heavy, heavy emphasis in both is about building more houses and in particular about home ownership. There was a brief time back in the Theresa May government when there appeared to be a shift away from the Cameron Osborne axis of it all being about home ownership and maybe more looking more towards rental tenures, but we seem to have lurched very definitely back in the other direction. So, what about the uh, changes to the current system? Well, this is a relatively easy white paper uh, to understand. It's relatively short, it's only about 40 pages long, and there are essentially only four elements to it. Um, and I think there are, there are probably a couple that are of particular interest. The first one is about standard methodologies and assessing housing need. Now, uh, many of you on this call will be real experts in this, more so than I am, uh, and I'm sure lots of you will have your own views on this, but 
We've seen over the course of this summer the problems associated with algorithms and we know in terms of assessing housing need uh, in the current system and previous planning systems uh, that it is particularly difficult to get right and it also requires a bit of time in order to bed in. Generally speaking, the commentary on this standard methodology, which you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to go into in any particular detail today, um, is that it's going to create more housing need in London and the South. And then I suppose the question on that is, well, whatever happened to the levelling up agenda? And also that this new methodology um, is, is likely to disproportionately affect rural communities. And so, again, lots of you on this call uh, will probably have your own views on that. The second element to the changes to the current system consultation is in relation to first homes. Now, many of you will remember starter homes, and some of you may have even dealt with some Section 106 agreements uh, encouraging starter homes to be built. You may even be in the lucky position where uh, you've actually got some way down the track in relation to starter homes. But as far as I'm aware, uh, there has been almost no activity in relation to starter homes. And now we're in a position where first homes uh, are already on the statute books and this consultation proposal is to um, is to add extra emphasis to it. So as a reminder, starter homes are a form of, um, uh, of home, home ownership tenure that is designed to be affordable. It's 30% discount on, on market value and that is even on subsequent sales. Um, it's aimed at first-time buyers, but we're told that there will be key worker prioritisation um, and there are going to be price caps and this is the same as with starter homes. So there will be a price cap for uh, dwellings within London and then a separate one outside of London. And again, it doesn't at the moment, the way it's drafted, really seem to fit with the levelling up agenda. This proposal is that 25% of all affordable housing to be delivered through Section 106 is going to need to be first homes. Now, that in itself is quite a significant change for many of you, and it will certainly be a significant change for your members and will have a big impact on uh, housing waiting lists and the like. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, the third point in this uh, consultation is in relation to the small site policy, which we'll come on to, and that's going to have an impact in of itself on this uh, uh, ability to deliver 25% through all Section 106 agreements. The other thing to note, which we'll come on to, is in the white paper, there's a suggestion that 25% of all contributions full stop will be towards first homes. So this is a major driver for this particular government, and it is aimed, as I say, at first-time buyers. Now, the third element to the consultation on the current system is the small site policies. Now, the suggestion is that the threshold, which is currently effectively 10 dwellings, subject to exceptions, will be raised to 40 or maybe even 50 units. So you could, in theory, have a site of 50 dwellings, which will have no Section 106 agreement attached to it, and that could happen soon. The idea and the reason for this is that it's supposed to be uh, kickstarting the um, SME end of the house builder sector. Um, allowing them the ability to bid for sites without worrying about Section 106 contributions and therefore um, in theory, and it says this in the consultation, this will enable more sites to come forward. Now I'd, I'd question that as a statement for starters, but secondly, is this really going to work in terms of um, saving the SME sector? It will um, almost certainly, and we've actually seen this, uh, not so much in this region so far, but certainly in other regions, the big PLC house builders are already now uh, gearing up and looking at sites that are around this side, size because they can see this one coming. So I don't think it's necessarily going to help uh, SMEs in terms of being able to bid for sites. I think they're going to be outbid. Now, the big question for all of you listening to this call is what is the implication on delivery of affordable housing and on delivery of both on-site and, if you haven't got SIL, off-site? infrastructure and I think um, I'm sure most of you will agree that this is going to be fairly catastrophic for rural areas given that 40 or 50 units is actually a pretty big site and the proposal is that there'll be no section 106 contributions whatsoever 
The fourth one uh, is in relation to permission in principle. Now, I'm sure most of you will know what permission in principle is all about. It's the, um, the theoretical sort of uh, old school red line on a plan um, with very little detail at that stage. You get your permission in principle and then you get what's known as a technical details consent to follow after that with all of the detail. It was in effect limited to just brownfield sites and to minor sites at the moment. Um, and there has been very little take up of this. In fact, in the last couple of years, I think we've had one inquiry in relation to permission in principle, bearing in mind we deal with sort of four or 500 uh, different sites a year in our team. It's, it's extremely rare. So the question is, should we extend? And, um, and what do we do uh, about it? Now, I think maybe permission in principle is something that is, is relatively harmless. And I'm not convinced that the industry is going to take it up in, in particularly high numbers because it is effectively shifting the burden in one direction. And then as you'll see from the white paper, there is also an emphasis on front loading the process. So is permission in principle really gonna be the answer? Don't know. So the, uh, the second uh, consultation, they both came out on the same day, unfortunately, uh, is the white paper entitled Planning for the Future. And as has been the case for many years now, there seems to be a, a central government um, mission, which is to blame the planning system for lack of house building in this country. And yet the Lions Report, the Letwin Review, people like uh, Bob Kerslake and others have all stated categorically that uh, it is not the planning system that is the cause of lack of house building. But anyway, as you can see from Boris Johnson's uh, comments here, uh, he's blaming the outdated and ineffective planning system. Uh, thanks to our planning system, we've nowhere near homes in the right places, etc. Uh, likewise, the Secretary of State uh, uh, has said that um, people need the security and dignity of a home of their own and a simpler, fastable, faster and more predictable system. And in particular, and Deborah is going to come on to this, um, there's, a, there's an emphasis on this white paper on design and um, looking at uh, pattern books and the likes of uh, places like Bourneville, Bath, Belgravia, uh, etc. And so what about the background? Well, most of you on this call will be pretty familiar with the planning system. Um, there are lots of problems with it. It is undoubtedly complicated. Now, there's a big question mark, and perhaps William will come on to this, as to whether or not it is actually possible to have a simple planning system in this country. And I'd probably argue that it isn't. But there's no doubt, and I'm sure everyone would agree, that local plans do take too long, and so something needs to be done about that. The big question is what? Uh, there's a perceived lack of public trust in the planning system, and I'm not completely sure I agree with that, particularly when you bear in mind that that was, that was the Tony Blair government's uh, agenda in terms of uh, addressing planning, was to get away from centralised uh, planning. Um, and planning obligations again uh, take the rap for delay and not enough focus on design. It is, I should just say at this point, it is just a white paper. Um, so it is supposed to be indicating a direction of travel, but actually when you read it, um, a lot of the white paper is drafted more like a green paper. It's almost aspirational with very, very little detail as to how it might work in practice. So how's it gonna work? Well, there are five proposals, streamlining the planning process, and that in theory will create more democracy and more efficiency at the plan making stage. Uh, a radical digital first approach, bringing new focus on design and sustainability, improving infrastructure delivery, and an interesting uh, phrase here, uh, ensuring developers play their part. Now I'm sure most uh, applicants would argue that that's uh, pretty unfair. And ensuring more land is available um, to support renewal of our town and city centres. And how's that going to work? Well. The way we're going to do this, uh, this presentation this morning and to a certain extent the questions uh, afterwards is to focus on the three pillars that are uh, within this white paper. So pillar one is planning for development, pillar one is in connection with beauty and sustainability and then pillar three is in relation to infrastructure and connected places. Now I think Steve's also going to touch on the last part of the white paper which is about delivering change and in particular there is a bit like with the SIL regulations, there's, there's a hint at 
um, a more role for enforcement within the planning system than there currently is. So again, there's going to be question marks in relation to a local planning authority resources, I'm sure. So I'm going to hand you over to uh, William Upton QC now, who's going to take you through pillar one of the planning white paper uh, in about half an hour. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom, and uh, good morning. And I'll just hope that the technology uh, allows me to go through the various slides that I have. Uh, if not, I'll have to ask for some assistance just to make sure that uh, you can follow uh, what is obviously quite a radical part of this paper. And I've taken my title from what is said in the foreword by uh, Boris Johnson, that his aim essentially, or what the proposal of the paper is, is to tear the system down and start again. And that's obviously a very bold claim. Some people have quite a big promise. And what one needs to bear in mind, well, how much does this achieve that? And also, how much do we as planners have to adjust uh, what we have been doing? And indeed, how does the transition work towards this brave new world? Uh, I have to say, a lot of the white paper is quite sketchy. Some of the issues are left fairly open, and I suppose that's why there is consultation. Uh, and one in particular is how do we set national housing numbers? Uh, but it's also likely to be very resource hungry. Uh, and particularly, as was just mentioned, this sort of idea of front loading everything particularly at the plan making stage. Uh, and that unsp unsurprisingly means we could have a very busy few years just ahead. Can I have the next slide? There are two versions of the planning paper, just so you know. One has the glossy pictures, but no paragraph numbers. And one has uh, what's called a web, web accessible version. And so the paragraph numbers I'm gonna to refer to come from that version. Uh, but it is true to say that all the pictures I'm going to be using are coming from this glossy version of this new world into which we're entering. And of course, this has just been mentioned. I'm just looking at the first part. And though it talks about pillars, it's rapidly uh, a terminology that's not used in the rest of the paper. It's just a simple way I see of trying to understand the different elements that they're putting together to make this new system work because they talk much more about proposals and they talk much more about the queries that they have that they want you to respond on. Can we have the next slide? It is summarized for local authorities in this very simple paragraph that the preparation of reform local plans, development of new design codes, a major overhaul of development contributions and a streamlined approach to decision-making Will have profound implications for how local planning authorities need to note is there's a very significant emphasis on digital uh, data and using sort of online versions of the plan so that everything becomes much more accessible but also machine readable which is why some people have slightly groaned knowing how well algorithms have worked in other areas but of course there is a lot that could be done within planning uh, and or has already been done uh, to make plans much more uh, accessible on the web and they certainly want to drive that forward and that's partly to do with the speed and predictability that they're seeking. Come to the next slide. They talk about proposals. I've just picked out, they say at the beginning there are five main proposals and then actually you'll find within the document specific proposals with specific areas. So these are just the high level ones. And the first uh, is that they want to streamline the planning process with more democracy taking place more effectively at the plan making stage. And I'll come back to that slightly interesting assertion. But they do say, and we'll replace the entire corpus of plan making law in England to achieve this. So obviously quite a lot uh, that's gonna have to happen in primary legislation. Second, we will take a radical digital first approach to modernize the planning process. And this means moving from a process on, based on documents to a process driven by data, um, an interesting uh, sort of shift, and we'll have to see uh, how that goes. Then the next uh, set of proposals, can I have that slide? And just seeing how it fits together, we will bring a new focus on design and sustainability, and that's what so we're gonna hear from the next speaker. Fourth, we will improve infrastructure delivery in all parts of the country. And, um, I've just been pointed out in terms of technology you at the moment can't see me. So there we are, back to hopefully uh, a talking uh, face as well as a talking voice. The, these three proposals, uh, 
essentially there's a, a new focus on design which I'm not going to cover, but is a very important part of how this is going to fit together. Fourth, that we're going to improve infrastructure delivery in all parts of the country and ensure developers play their part through reform of developer contributions, which is what we're going to hear about from Stephen Bell. And fifth, we propose to ensure more land is available for the homes and development people and communities need and to support renewal of our town and city centres. Now, that, of course, is perhaps the acid test, the substance, uh, about which there isn't, I have to say, a lot of detail in this paper. And can we go to the next slide? What we find within the introductions, and just Tom has touched on this, is uh, two very beautiful pictures of the two main politicians involved. And it is interesting that this is being fronted by the Prime Minister. But the reason I particularly gone back to that is it very much highlights that their concern is about hazard. And it's about, indeed, the particular quotes that they have picked out next to their photographs and then sense the emphasis they want to put on it and just picking out what Boris Johnson is saying is the homes we need and the places we want to live in at prices we can afford so that all of us are free to live where we cannot sorry where we can connect our talents with opportunity and it's interesting how housing is front and center uh, of so much of the concerns that they have identified um, and I think perhaps to the uh, disadvantage of other areas. Can we move to the next slide, please? So if you look at the system they want to create as a fairly familiar turf about local plans and local plans being a good foundation on which to base reform and the fact that this is where local requirements can be identified and assessed and there's a forum for debates and different views. And you think, well, that's fairly familiar. And there's the national policy planning framework and we know what that does. Go on to the next slide, please. And again, it, it starts talking about the value of local plans that they perhaps, you can see almost the debating room in which this paper was created, say, well, do we need local plans at all? And they basically say, well, no, they, they do provide real value. They allocate the land for development in the right places. They give certainty about what can be developed. They make the process for getting permission relatively simple. And they give local communities uh, the opportunity to be involved. And you think, well, that sounds all very familiar. Can we move to the next slide, please? Because, of course, uh, there are some questions which are very easy to answer. I mean, who doesn't want a faster and more certain planning system? And the interesting thing is they pick up this technology point and they say, do you agree with our proposals? And you think, well, there's really a lot more devil in the detail. Uh, though they're obviously clearly very nice pictures that they can produce of digital planning. I have to say, for myself from a more analog age, I do wonder how the lady is actually indicating with her finger to someone who's only got a headset on about how it's working. And inevitably we'll see how the technology really does fit together. Again, not so we have the detail on, but the ambition is there. And can we then move to the substance about what the local plans are going to be about? Have the next slide, please. Because the thing I wanted to, to really pick out is one of the real headline points is this is not plan led in the sense that you and I have become used to or the system that we have been uh, working in. Because the plans that they want to create, uh, and what, more to the point, sorry, I'll turn it around. The plans that they want you to write are there to, they say, set the rules. And they're not going to be containing general policies about development. They're not going to be containing general allocations. They want to, in a sense, set the parameters for development. So you have identified areas, you have identified heights, scales, and densities that would fit within the particular areas. And the idea is, once you've got that in place, and there are the design codes to give you more of the detail, then it's what they might refer to as a compliance-led system with a need for enforcement of that. So the rules, not policies. And obviously there's this emphasis on the data, but it's, it's a very important shift in the way that we think of what plans can do. Uh, and this is why people are starting talking about an equivalent to a zoning system. The headlines, and I'm sure this is a bit that you're familiar with, you would have seen that they want to allocate all land. So there's never going to be a corner of England which hasn't got a designation or a category or categorization, as they call it, a growth area or a renewal area or a protected area. And it's very interesting, they don't like, they don't use the word zoning. Everyone else uses it because that's how, if you look abroad, is uh, the way that planning can be done. And they do refer to somewhere like the Netherlands or Japan, where they think is a good example. 
And those are areas that you use as zones, and they're very detailed codes. Um, and it can get to the stage, for instance, in New York, you've got lots of different zones, and the actual accompanying text runs to about four and a half thousand pages. You can create a very, very detailed system with a map of zones and then people be able to read what can or cannot be done in any particular zone. And that is, of course, the risk of moving to this idea of just having a series of areas of land with then details about what you can do there, that it is actually potentially more complex than we have at the moment. But what is it all about? Can I have the next slide, please? I want to sort of start with the bit that we perhaps would be most familiar with. They start with growth areas and then renewal and protected. I wanted to start with the bits that perhaps is not the greatest change, protected areas, where they say, as the name suggests, the development is restricted. And this is going to be the areas of national designations such as Greenbelt or AOMB and conservation areas also would fit within this. And then some locally defined areas that if they fit the particular policy objectives, and that would be things like local wildlife sites and uh, protected open space. And they do interestingly acknowledge it could include open countryside, which doesn't fall within the other two categories. And then you can see that the lines on the map start getting really important as to where you define the limits of what area. But it's also worth noting that in this area, if you wanted to get permission, you could still apply for planning permission. So again, familiar, because we're used to that sort of system with all the considerations that come into it. But of course, uh, that's not where their main focus is because they're trying to produce enough land. So can we have the next slide, please? The renewal areas, referred to as those are suitable for some development, this is where the local plan starts becoming very important because it's meant to set out what the acceptable uses would be within that um, particular area. And it's going to set out the heights and densities, and this is when it starts coming into the design area. And you can start having sub areas, which is interesting, sort of the mix of uses. So you start seeing this isn't just three areas, it could be much more of a patchwork. Within these areas, there will be a statutory presumption, so they'll have to change the legislation to say permission basically should be granted in favour of the uses specified as being suitable in each area. So if your plan has said that is suitable, per se, then a statutory presumption in its favour. And then they give examples to get a feel for what it could be. So they use this interesting phrase, gentle densification or infill development in town centres, uh, development in rural areas uh, of a certain level. And so you can start to see that this is certainly a step beyond what we have at the moment. Uh, and the way in which consent is given is also different. Can we have the next slide, please? Because they're not saying this is a planning application process. They're saying there should, first of all, be equivalent almost of the prior approval process. I mean, they refer to it not quite in that language. They call this an automatic consent for pre-specified forms of development uh, and if it meets the design and, and they do half refer to prior approval requirements then that would get permission so they can see that's where it essentially would be a compliance system you say well i'm within the category set out in the plan that you have established i meet the design criteria i meet the other points that are relevant I therefore have this automatic permission, I can just get on with it. Well, if that doesn't quite work, and there's some variations, they say the other way of doing it, let's have a faster application process. Interesting. Um, well, we get to see the detail of that, but the idea is that if you're within the local plan description and within the national policies, then it should be quicker. There would also be the ability for local development orders or neighborhood orders, again, to define the parameters. And I suppose that is theoretically a familiar ground. And then finally, if you actually have a site that doesn't fit within the categories, you can still go for that planning application. The idea being if something has come up or change of circumstances, then the planning application route would be open to you. But you can start seeing there is some complication built into this automatic consent. Of course, things get more interesting in the final area, if I can move to the next slide. The growth areas, suitable for substantial development. And as you can expect, this is where they expect comprehensive development, urban extensions, areas for redevelopment to fall within this category of areas already pre-identified. 
uh, and it could include areas around universities, they say, or clusters of businesses. They accept that you would have to exclude areas at flood risk. And then they use this intriguing phrase that also it wouldn't include uh, areas where there are important constraints without then telling us what those are. But as you can imagine, the idea is that it's it's meant to follow through, that there are certain predetermined constraints that mean you can't have a growth area there. Uh, and you move on to the areas that don't have that. And they also mention that it you could include those constraints if they're going to be fully mitigated. A little hint, obviously, about how design can perhaps get around the problems, say, of setting a listed building. But the way in which consent is going to be given, of course, um, is essentially, again, this compliance idea. At the stage that the plan is adopted, outline approval for development will be automatically secured for forms and types of development specified in that growth area. And then you're on to, so to speak, they would think of the more um, detailed approach of things like, well, what's in the master plan or design code? And that, of course, you think, well, that does have quite a lot more detail than perhaps they accept. But it's meant to be a bit like a reserve master approval, like a development approval, because the principle is there and people can get on with investing the time and energy and front loading that Tom's mentioned in these growth areas for the delivery of these significant amounts of development. And there's also this hint, and I'm sure you've picked it up, about the maybe you want to use development consent orders, the nationally strategic sites, uh, and using that process for the exceptionally large sites. Um, and just before I mentioned, the development corporations could also come into that. Uh, again, detail to be provided. Just, just so you're aware, of course, this being a green paper, sorry, a white paper with questions, there are alternative options that they do sometimes flag, and I've just picked these up because they are two important ones, because they're saying instead of the three areas, we could reduce it to two. And policy exchanges are very keen on just being two, just restraint or anything goes, sorry, um, growth or renewal area. And they want answers on that. Or they say, well, why don't we not quite radically get rid of everything we've currently got? Let's introduce the growth area idea, and then everything else can remain roughly as it is but we definitely want the growth areas and the permissions that are automatically given. Something they want answers on and we'll have to see how it works. But you can imagine they really have, the idea is for the three main areas. How are we gonna test this? Can we move to the next slide, please? Because the other thing I want to do is to speed up the local plan process. Don't we all? But they basically say, we're gonna get rid of some of the hurdles and some of the um, tests that currently apply. We're gonna have one test called sustainable development. We're gonna have no soundness test. We're gonna have no DT to cooperate test. And we're gonna have no sustainability appraisal. Gosh, I guess rid of a lot of paper, doesn't it? And you think, well, yes, but then what do you want us to satisfy? What is the test the inspector will come along and, and look for? And it's something called sustainability, sustainable development test, which apparently we all agree on. And it is the phrase that's used, achievement of sustainable development is an existing and well understood basis for the planning system. Not where I sit, but then maybe you would think this is a paper written by people who haven't done local plans. And the answer is no, it isn't, because some of the people on the group they went to have promoted local plans. So that it's it's trying to strip away, I suppose, some of the hurdles, um, trying to give the inspector perhaps a greater discretion about the social, economic, and environmental balance. And we also want to give the inspector the power to dictate. So when you apply, he will or she will rewrite the plan if they need to and make binding recommendations. But they're not going to be held to the soundness test. There isn't going to be the duty to cooperate. So they're just looking at your area, which they think simplifies things. And they feel that too many plans at the moment fall down on what they partly see as a technical problem. Uh, and the sustainability appraisal process, they basically consider has become far too complex. So let's strip it back. Uh, there are some things that will still need to be done. And you may recall, if you ever looked at that guidance about sustainability appraisal, it does say it incorporates what would be needed with strategic environmental assessment. So in a sense, they're going back to that core of the law, 
and getting rid of the stone base here pretzel. Can you go on to the next slide? Because they also want to simplify what you're going to have to do. And this is controversial, of course. They want a nationally set standard method for housing. And they're going to tell you the numbers. And they're going to take into account the constraints in those numbers and then tell you what the number is. So they think simplifying the local planning process. I would think, well, they're just shifting the debate somewhere else. And then when asked, well, how does this work? The local plan, sort of the local plan won't obviously be able to question it, but the white paper doesn't tell us how it's going to happen. And the only comment I've seen in the press, uh, indeed from uh, the director of planning of the ministry, was there will be further consultation about how they might achieve this, because you think that, aren't we getting close to a national spatial plan on housing? If we are going to take into account constraints, doesn't that require consultation and proper um, involvement? to be confirmed. But they do tell us that 300,000 is still the number that they want to see. And there's no debate allowed about that. They also want to strip out the policies so that they'll be set at the national level and you just basically use the policies that the national policy framework says are development management policies. There is perhaps wiggle room. They do suggest as one of the alternatives you might be able to justify local policies uh, which are non-standard, but that really is only the alternative. The main idea is to not have a debate at local plan about these sort of policies. And uh, there's just, just this comment about other needs in housing. I have to scour the mic paper to actually find it. And there it is in one paragraph. The URL also meant to identify areas to meet the range of development needs. And then interestingly, across 10 years, not 15, not 20, but across 10. The whole idea being to simplify it. Can we have the next slide, please? Because just when you might think, um, that's quite a lot to do. They've also said you have to do it within a time scale. And you're going to have a statutory duty to adopt it, and we're going to give you 30 months. And how's that 30 months made up? Well, they give you an idea in the white paper how it will be. There'll be essentially five stages. Stage one, you call for site. Stage two, you get to write uh, your new style local plan uh, and prepare all your evidence. Stage three, you basically submit it and people have a chance to comment on it. Stage four, the inspector, bless him or her, only get nine months in which to consider it. Uh, and the right to be heard might be restricted to what the inspector thinks is appropriate. So people may only be heard on paper, for all we know. And then there's that six week period for when it has to be adopted and comes into force and voila, 30 months. And if you don't make 30 months, there's gonna be sanctions. What are the sanctions? I don't know. But essentially, I suppose it is government intervention. Uh, and the alternatives, well, to some extent, they're saying won't change the time scale, but we might require the ability for the inspector to allow some hearings. Uh, some perhaps can be done in writing. The whole process could be like a neighbourhood plan. So that they are still open to some suggestions on this. Can you have the next slide? So what should you do? Here you are in 2020 being told the system is going to basically be changed by national legislation next year. And indeed, they want your new style plans in place by the time of the next general election, 2024. So it really means that they're expecting to produce this legislation and these changes by the end of next year. And they do say this 30 months is the absolute and they're only going to allow people to have slightly longer if they've got an existing plan. Slight relief, I'm sure, for those of you who have an existing plan, but it has to have been adopted in the last three years from the legislation. So obviously quite a narrow window. Or one where you've submitted it to the Secretary of State for examination, and then you get 42 months for that plan to breathe its last before you have the new start to come in. Interesting, of course, because you then have to think ahead um, about what resources you spend and on what, because I still consider this system requires an enormous amount of effort up front. They may say it becomes a lot simpler once the local plan is in place, but of course you've got to have a plan that you're happy to live with because that's the only game in town. And then they say you have to review it every five years. So yes, there is some ability to review it, but they're not expecting you to have a sort of perpetual motion of local plan making. Can we have the next slide? There are some unresolved areas. Let's be frank about this. They do ask you the question, 
without suggesting any answer about how could strategic cross-boundary issues be best planned for in the absence of a duty to cooperate? Or well, we might have a few ideas about that. Then there's that question about neighbourhood plans. Well, they're very keen on them. If you read the paper, they really like them. But they said, do you agree that they should be retained as part of the reform system without really saying how they fit into the reform system? And the answers they suggest are yes, no, not sure. <laughs> and you think, well, what is it the local plan will be doing that neighbourhood plan could not and vice versa and it might well be design related. Can you have the next slide please? There's still the big issue about deliverability and infrastructure and let's pick up the point that they do still consider that that could be a reason for a plan to fail or for sites not to be included and obviously that overlaps a huge amount with pillar three which I'll leave Steve to cover and perhaps we'll come back to what it does mean. Can you have the next slide please? How about this point about public involvement uh, and also mention about developers in a, in a moment. Well, for the public, of course, there was a lot of criticism when the white paper first came out and the headlines and people saying this is very anti-democratic. It really is excluding local people. And the government said, no, it isn't. And indeed, if you've heard uh, Christopher Kalkowski, uh, who's one of the lawyers involved in their working group, he was arguing with the radio because he didn't agree with this interpretation. And why is this? Because if you think about it, we have eliminated decision making at the committee stage for individual applications you know, under this new system. There'll be very few planning applications and they'll essentially to be a lot about compliance. And there perhaps lies the answer. They consider that the opportunity for local people and for councillors to get involved and to basically influence what the area should look like is at the plan making stage. And they make the perhaps valid point that a lot of people don't attach that same importance to local plans. They find them difficult to understand, difficult to get involved with, and only certain people turn up and most of the people are unheard. And they want to change that, and they want you to change that, and they want you to come up with radical ways of engaging the public in sort of online media or perhaps on your phone. People will say, oh, I'll vote for that, not for this. Well, they want you to think outside the box and get involved. And perhaps there's a very good reason for it, because under this system, the only stage at which the public and the local councillors can influence what goes into the plan is essentially that representation stage in the middle of the stages and that's it. After that, it's um, a technical process. Controversial, unsurprisingly, uh, but that is what the idea is. Can we move to the next slide, please? Because developers equally have a, a shift in emphasis. Their main influence, a point of uh, perhaps maximum concentration should be at stage one, they're being asked for sites to be included. Uh, and to do some of the work to support that, because though other permission rates do remain, the emphasis essentially is on the local plan. And I do use the phrase permission in principle, because that's essentially what the local plan seems to be doing. And then after that, the shift would be to well, complying with what the, lo with the local plan says and what its constraints are and what the design codes say. And then it's a sort of pattern book and go with it. And obviously for them, they're going to be standardized documents. They're going to be shortened applications, I think allowed at the moment, suggestion is 50 pages to uh, cover all the relevant points. And you think, well, that's interesting. Um, but the other thing to note, of course, is if they only get one opportunity, and this is a thing a commentary has picked up, then that rather fixes the value of anyone's land. If you're not in the local plan and you're not within the, the areas of growth or renewal, there's a very good reason for local authorities say no to anything you want to do. And therefore, the hope value really diminishes. And, it's certainly a feature of areas in the, other, in the world where they have zoning, that there is real predictability about what the value of land is because it's been determined through the zone code. And if that's the case, I can imagine developers getting uh, quite worked up about what the local plan says and putting a lot of effort into it. And I suppose that is the flip side of this system is that if you want to set the rules and give certainty, then the pressure points about when you can influence it become so much more important. Uh, and the other thing, can I have the next slide, please? The um, whole system has this rather unusual mention uh, that it might still be possible for planning applications to be made and for the local plan to be seen as out of date. And that's a system we have to say are very familiar with. Because, of course, as you all know, you can adopt your local plan 
and someone can argue it's out, out of date because you failed the five-year housing land supply test or the housing delivery test one month after adoption i think actually my record is six weeks um someone came forward and said your plan is out of date none of the stack out that needs to be delivered and you think oh my goodness here we go again and then the local plan fades into the background and we have this debate about the national level and you can think this is undermining the whole system maybe the new system won't have this uh yes it does still have this ability and it's mentioned at the moment they they think they won't need the five-year housing land supply test because you will have done the work for your local plans to show there is a supply of land, but they will hold you to account on the housing delivery test. And the phrase is basically said, having enough land supply in the system does not guarantee it will be delivered. We can understand that. And so we propose to maintain the housing delivery test and the presumption in favour of stone development as part of the new system. And you know, and I know that's the tilted balance and the ability for any developer to turn up and rewrite what should be happening. I am very unsettled by this. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of the planning new world that they want to create of certainty and compliance and predictability, because it would allow people to come along and rewrite things. However, I think they are trying to create a bit of a hybrid, which is why they don't use the terms zones. They don't, I can't look around the world and say the system they want is what Netherlands have got or what America has got. No, they've sort of taken certain elements, tried to simplify it, but also tried to keep the ability for planning applications to be made when things have not gone according to plan. I find that troubling. But equally, it may be not as bad as I might think, because the one thing that I'm missing from my talk, of course, is this thing about design codes. And that might be where a lot more control comes in. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, one of the images within the uh, white paper, uh, it's one I've picked out, sorry, in the next slide, is that uh, public consultation could include people talking about quality of materials, and there's a picture from a consultation process, someone looking at bricks. Uh, that could become far more important, and the constraints that that imposes could become far more important in this new system. And so uh, it is with great pleasure I want to pass on to the next speaker, uh, who will talk about Pillar 2. Uh, and Deborah Sharples uh, will hopefully give us a feel for what that produces in this new system. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as thank you, William. Um, my name is Deborah Sharples, and I'm going to talk about Pillar Two. Um, you may remember that um, Pillar One was entitled um, "Planning for Development." Could you have the next slide, please? And Pillar Two is entitled "Planning for Beautiful and Sustainable Places," which sounds really, really lovely, doesn't it? And if Pillar One is all about speeding up the process and bringing forward uh, land to be developed, providing houses, you might be forgiven for thinking that Pillar 2 is in contrast about putting the brakes on a bit, making sure that we identify the areas that need to be protected and making sure the steps are in place to protect them. Um, and it is, um, undoubtedly, but there is also a strong element still in Pillar 2 of speed is the essence of this proposed new system. Can we have the next slide, please? So looking um, initially at the overview of the aims of this part of the paper, um, they are undoubtedly all very laudable aims and it'd be very hard for anybody to argue with them as being good. Um, they are aiming to create beautiful places to protect the environment, combat climate change, engage communities, foster high quality development, and make sure that we provide for beautiful buildings, but also for parks, gardens, and green spaces in between. And in line with the proposals in the Environment Bill and the way things are moving generally, to secure net gains for quality, both in our built and natural environment, um, and not just no net harm, as we've had before. And in the paper, there are eight proposals that deal with this area of planning for beautiful places and sustainable places. They are numbers 11 to 14, which focus on the built environment. 15, 16 and 18, which in my mind focus on the natural world and on environmental protection, and proposal 17 that focuses on the historic environment. I propose to start at the end of all that and look first at the natural world, which is the area looked at last by the paper, by this pillar anyway. Can I have the next slide please? 
So um, the proposals for the natural environment are to protect the places of environmental value which matter to us most. And very specifically, there's protection in there um, for national and international sites of importance, there's things like SSSIs and national parks, and also protection for areas of local importance. So those identified sites, such as local wildlife sites, will get protection within the plan. I'm a little concerned about the rest of the natural environment. There's a very large part of the countryside which is not subject to any of those sort of protections or identifications. Um, and there is a big, a big emphasis in the first pillar in um, identifying areas for growth. Um, and I think there will be considerable concern that um, normal, ordinary countryside, as you might call it, will be at some considerable risk under this, um, pr these proposals if you like to see your countryside not developed. But the paper does say that um, the local the planning system can and should do so much more than just protecting those identified areas. And so um, it does say that the government wants to protect environmental recovery and long-term sustainability, adapt to climate change, reduce pollution, increase green spaces and trees and maximise walking and cycling. Um, it's going to be important in the local plan process to maximise walking and cycling. And that, of course, makes a contribution not only to communities and well-being, but also to the environment. And also um, the paper does identify that some areas were identified as being important for um, management of flood risk. So if we move on to the next slide, please look at some of these specific proposals for the natural environment. These are, as I mentioned, proposals 15, 16 and 18. And the way that those general overriding aims are going to be achieved is by amending the national planning policy framework to target the areas where um, you can best use the planning system to adapt to climate change and to secure environmental benefits, to make the environmental impact assessment system quicker and simpler, and to enhance energy efficiency in buildings. So moving on to the first of those, um, proposals, please. The next slide. This is the amendment of the National Planning Policy Framework. And it says it's an amendment to target areas in which the system can help to mitigate and adapt to climate change and maximise environmental benefits. I have to say I'm slightly uncertain whether that means geographical areas or areas of policy. I think it must mean areas of policy because the National Planning Policy Framework is going to aim itself at um, high level strategic policy development management policies um, and we're told um, that these changes to the national planning policy framework will be consulted on in the autumn which is pretty much now so i think we can expect something to come out in the fairly near future for some changes to the national planning policy framework as i said the development management policies are going to be in the national planning policy framework and not any longer in the local plan is the intention Local plans are going to be reserved for much more spatially specific policies. So it'll be the role of the local plan to, for example, identify important local views, uh, areas that might be appropriate for public access, where, for example, forestry creation schemes can be um, implemented, and perhaps, um, well, obviously not, perhaps definitely dealing with nature uh, recovery networks and the like. Um, the whole um, thing, to my mind, the whole proposal has a pretty heavy top-down sort of feel to it. We feel like there's, there's going to be more emphasis on proposals put forward or policies put forward at national level with which we all have to comply and the local plan will be a tool for saying how those policies will specifically apply in the particular local areas. So the overall aim of these changes to the National Planning Policy Framework is going to be to try and strengthen the position of the environmental considerations in planning, whilst at the same time speeding up the whole process and simplifying environmental impact assessment. Uh, to my mind, that will be quite a neat trick if it can be pulled off. Um, could you do the next slide, please? So the second um, element of uh, these proposals is reform of environmental impact assessment. 
to speed up this process while enhancing the most valuable important habitats and species. Um, the government recognises in this paper that it is important to consider the environment properly, um, and, but there is also um, a sense that they feel that environmental impact assessment and strategic impact assessment and those whole processes around them have got rather out of hand. We're leaving the uh, European Union, we've left the European Union, um, and so there's an opportunity since those processes are driven by European rules um, to make changes now that we're freer to do so. A lot of my time is spent dealing with environmental impact assessments. Um, they can be a very contentious area um, and they generate a lot of work for consultants. They create a lot of expense for developers and a lot of aggravation for local authorities because they also give rise to a lot of opportunities for challenge for planning consents. Um, the proposals are as yet lacking in any detail um, and there is a great deal to consider. What we do know is that the um, white paper wants these um, environmental impact assessments done early in the process. They want um, there to be a lot of readily available data that people carrying out assessments can call upon easily that will give uniformity of um, content and detail and will give rise to a need for fewer site surveys. I am a little bit sceptical about that myself because I think site surveys on site-specific information is really important to a proper environmental impact assessment. But the idea here is to make it quicker, simpler, presumably produce less paper. Um, so this particular can has been kicked down the road. Um, but it's only been kicked down the road a short distance because we're told again we're going to hear more about this in the autumn. Uh, do we move on to the next slide, please? So energy efficiency, um, this is the final environmental goal. This is energy efficient standards for buildings. Um, and the idea here is that it, from 2025, new homes will produce 25 to 50% less carbon dioxide than they do now. Uh, and they'll be zero carbon ready so that they can um, produce zero carbon by 2050. Um, we are having a world leading commitment to net zero by 2050 and we just have to hope that it's um, on a different standard to our world beating test and trace system that we have at the moment. Um, the local planning authority in terms of energy efficiency for buildings is going to have a role both in setting the standards that are required and also in enforcing them. And bearing in mind what William said about uh, the resource hungriness of these uh, general proposals, the paper says that um, when the local planning authorities have been freed from many planning obligations through our reforms, they'll be able to use all their spare time to focus on enforcement. Um, speaking of energy efficiency, it means I can move um, very smoothly on to listed buildings because the government has identified that historic buildings may not be as energy efficient as some of the modern buildings. So could you move to the next slide, please? The proposal 17 um, recognises that the existing system has worked very well to protect heritage, um, but the intention now is to um, help historic buildings and assets to move in into the 21st century to play their role in um, supporting town centres and development but also to help them to have greater energy efficiency um, as we move towards net zero carbon. Um, that is going to be quite a challenge for historic buildings, but it has been an area of considerable contention over the years. Um, I've dealt with a, quite a few people very upset indeed that they're unable to um, give their buildings the, the sort of insulation that they want for modern living. Um, and it causes a significant conflict sometimes between property owners and the local planning authority. Um, there is also a desire in this to speed up the local plan process, sorry, the um, listed building process. Um, and there's a proposal to explore whether um, experienced specialists may have effectively earned the right to carry out certain types of work without the need to obtain what's described as routine listed building consents. Um, it's an interesting option um, because um, my experience down the years is that opinions as to what is right for a listed building 
um, are nothing if not varied and changing. So it will be interesting to see how that develops. So moving on then perhaps to the um, grittiest part of the pillar two, which is the built environment. The next slide takes us um, beyond looking at the um, natural environment, the historic environment. We're looking very much more here at the workaday built environment. But still, we want to create here beautiful places that will stand the test of time. And the whole idea, or the whole idea, part of the idea here is to make um, the local plan process a much more um, lively um, um, process and to help us through design codes and design guides to really have visions of how places can be. Um, and it's really important to here to engage communities. Um, all of this is aimed at fostering high quality um, development, beautiful buildings, parks, facilities, a sense of community. Um, and it's suggested that in recent decades, many new developments have fallen short of that aim um, and haven't reflected what's special in their area. So um, we look now at what the proposals are on how this can be achieved and have the next slide. So there are um, four proposals for the built environment. Um, and they rely, the, the whole process of making the development beautiful and reflect local um, character is to rely heavily on local design guidance and codes, which should be put together with, I should say with, not within, community involvement. Um, in order to help local authorities to bring forward these design codes, there's a proposal to have a body which will be intended to support the delivery of these guide codes, this is a national body, um, and to give Homes England an enhanced role in um, design and quality. Um, it may well be that Homes England becomes that body to, su to support the delivery. And then the final proposal, and um, this is easiest, easily, to my mind, the sexiest sound proposal in the whole paper, is a fast track for beauty. Um, the, the idea with the fast track for beauty is through policy and legislation, to incentivise um, development that reflects local character and preferences and is assumed therefore to be beautiful. But I have a real concern about this, um, and if you go on to the next slide please, which is who is going to be the judge of beauty. So in front of you you've got four pictures, um, the top right hand one, the blue sky, is Poundbury. Um, this is Prince Charles's um, development um, project. Some people see it as a, a, a sympathetic way of developing in Cornwall um, that brings forward local character and is highly livable. Other people say it's a pastiche development lacking in real character. Um, so there's, there's really divided views over that. The, the church tower either is or represents Coventry Cathedral, which you'll know was redeveloped after the war, leaving in place the ruins, but with a really ultra modern um, rebuilding of the main part of the cathedral. Many, many architects think it's a, a, a magnificent triumph. Many of the local people thought it was then a hideous monstrosity. Views may have changed as it's mellowed, but it just illustrates how uh, opinions can vary about what's beautiful. The beetle is standing in today for his friend the spider, because I initially was going to have a, a lovely spider, long legs, big web, um, but apparently before the nine o'clock watershed, spiders are too alarming, so we've gone for the beetle. Similarly though, very beautiful creature, but many, many of us would think it was a nasty, creepy crawly to be avoided. And finally, the Mona Lisa, famously beautiful, but doesn't do it for me, I'm afraid. Can you have the next slide, please? So I think um, it's going to be controversial to have a fast track for beauty. Um, what we are really going to have um, is a fast track for quality if this comes forward. Um, and the idea is that the system will create frameworks of quality and set clear expectations as to what forms of development will be acceptable in different areas. Um, that those developments will be expected to reflect local character and importantly community preferences. Uh, that does rather imply that there's a, a consistency of preference amongst the community and I, I can see there'll be significant differences of preference amongst communities in fact. Um, is to encourage types of building which have stood the test of time, but also to ensure that buildings and developments address modern lifestyles and also um, encourage or allow or enable industrial, quick, efficient forms of development. 
and all of this is going to be achieved using local design codes. If we move on to the next slide, please. So in terms of design codes, there's going to be two strata. There's going to be those national codes, the national design code, national model design code that's coming forward soon, and the manual for streets. And these are going to be to have, according to the white paper, a direct bearing on the design of new communities. Um, but in order to prevent too much homogeneity of development, it's really important to have local design codes as well. Um, these will reflect the diverse local character and also reflect what is provably popular locally. Um, this is going to um, involve quite a significant piece of work for local authorities or many pieces of work um, and they will need to be um, prepared wherever possible. So who will prepare the design codes? Could you move on to the next slide please? So what the paper says is that design codes will be prepared by local planning authorities to supplement their local plans. Um, there'll also be opportunities as now for neighbourhood planning groups to prepare them and in some circumstances for applicants to prepare them. Um, where an area of land is um, identified for substantial development in a growth area, then um, the legislation will require that there is a local um, a design code to go with or a raster plan to go with that designation. As they move a little bit further through the process, then more detailed plans will be required to um, address exactly how that development will come forward. Um, and it's expected that um, applicants for significant development will, as it moves through the process, take on the responsibility for the plans, but initially it'll be a local planning authority obligation. Um, in all cases, these plans must have significant inputs from the local community. And to my reading of the paper, that doesn't just mean the local community must be given an opportunity to input, but they must actually input in order for those plans to um, be as strong as they can possibly be. There will be an expert body to assist, as I mentioned. Um, but there's no doubt about it, this is going to be a really major area of work for local planning authorities. So having gone to all the effort of preparing them, I suppose the big question is what weight will they carry in the planning process? So can we move on to the next slide, please. So this is where the community involvement comes into play because if the local planning authority can demonstrate significant community input, then their local design codes will have weight in planning decisions and decisions will be made in line with those codes. If they can't, then the national codes will apply. What this suggests to me is both that local planning authorities will have to make sure that the local community actually takes part in a significant way, and it may not be enough just to have a few representatives on a panel, it may need to be much wider than that. Um, and it also suggests that those local planning authorities who don't have um, design codes, local design codes in place early in the process, um, or for areas where they don't have them in, in place, will um, be at a significant risk of losing control over what local development looks like, because um, the default then will be back to national codes and um, the opportunity to influence development will be lost. So in, in practice, local plans are likely to take a long time to prepare, particularly um, given the need for local involvement. Um, and I feel there's a real risk of there being more of a loss than a gain in local identity and input. Where they are in place, um, local authorities will have to be very careful to make sure that they are not overly detailed and overly prescriptive, because my experience of developers and design codes is that they get very anxious about overly prescriptive ones because they put up their costs, they delay their development, um, that in turn puts up the house prices and potentially reduces choice. So they're going to be really important and it's going to be really important that they are prepared quickly, of high quality and just the right um, level of detail. So finally, I've kept the exciting bit towards the end, um, the fast track for beauty. So can we move on please to the next slide? As I mentioned earlier, this is a fast track for beauty. Um, however, 
having had the, put the heading forward, Fast Track for Beauty, the um, text really moves on to questions of quality. Uh, and the reason for that is pretty obvious to my mind, which is it is very difficult to judge beauty. It's a very much a subjective quality, whereas you can look at um, a set of tick boxes for quality and say, does this um, comply with X, Y and Z? And if it does, then it can fall into our fast track. The idea here is that, we'll, that there will be an expedited process for getting permission for developments that comply with pre-existing principles of good design. Um, the National Planning Policy Framework is going to be updated to make this clear. And um, it will be an advantage for a development to comply with local design guides. Um, growth areas will have to have a, a master plan and a site specific code and any development coming forward will have to comply with those. And then the intention is that there will be a permitted development right for popular and repli replicable, replicable forms of development. Um, some of ones identified as being popular and replicable from the past are Victorian mansion flats, terraced houses, um, I might mention 1930s semis, the sorts of development that have, have stood the test of time. They're well built, they've got decent room sizes, um, in some cases, many cases, decent outdoor space and so forth. Um, and the intention is that um, there will be pattern books of development that's considered to be of an appropriate type to fall into this um, fast track. Um, and the whole idea, the whole process of a fast track for beauty will be to support something called gentle densification. And I think gentle densification is one of the most terrifying uh, phrases in this entire plan, because what's described in a government document as gentle densification may sound um, significantly more like intensification of development all around me to somebody who's living in the area. Um, I also um, do fear that although the paper is very clear that the pattern books will be modified for local, stand, local styles and standards and types, that this will tend to lead more towards uniformity of development than to diversity of development. You can see 1930s semis all over the country in towns, cities, villages, rural locations, and they all look exactly the same. So um, it's certainly a, an idea with, um, that needs to be considered, but it's also an idea that, that does have some potential downfalls. So move on to the final slide, please. Um, and I asked the question, what does all this mean for local planning authorities? Well, they will, I am sure, have to be um, quick and effective in preparation of design codes. It'll have to be done alongside the local planning process. So just when everybody's really busy bringing that in under the 30 month time limit, then this has got to be done as well. And they will have to be um, good quality codes. They'll need to be comprehensive, but they're not overly detailed. Um, and there'll also be the need to um, prove community involvement. So there will be quite a burden in um, making sure that this rather theoretical stage of planning <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is um, taken out to the public and that they engage with it. <coughs> so that will create quite a burden of resources, both financial, technical and time resources. But delay in producing those local design guides will lead to a loss of control over what development looks like. Um, there's also going to be a question of funding, all this extra work. Um, there is, are indications that there's be extra resources for local authorities financially. Um, uh, but I wonder, and this is not in the paper, it's just a thought of my own, I think developers are going to be very interested in um, contributing towards these design codes. And I wonder whether there might come forward a new type of um, agreement, the design code performance agreement, a little bit along the lines of planning performance agreement where the developers will contribute um, money and resources to doing the work. They'll recognise that they can't therefore expect it all to go their own way, but they'll put some obligations on a local planning authority to cooperate within a timely uh, time scale. Um, there, there'll be, the, the local authorities will have to clearly liaise closely with developers and with 
planning um, parish councils and community groups. Uh, but each local authority will get a new design and um, places chief to help with this process. And then here's the second most uh, terrifying phrase in the paper, which is that there'll be a degree of refocusing of professional skills. And I think what this means is that we'll move away from traditional um, development control planning and much more towards design code planning. Um, and I do wonder if the local planning authorities will, because of this change in system, change in expectation, be facing uh, quite a period of public discontent as people who didn't think to, do, to get engaged in the local plan process suddenly find development happening and it's too late for them to comment. So um, moving on now to pillar three, that was pillar two, and I'd like to hand over to Stephen to deal with pillar three, please. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I've got pillar three, uh, planning for infrastructure and connected places. And um, if I could have the uh, next slide, please. OK, as an overview, um, new development, as we know, brings demand for uh, public services and infrastructure. And to mitigate, uh, to mitigate that, uh, we, we have uh, 106 contributions. Uh, and uh, we know from 2018, 2019, that some £7 billion was received from Section 106s. And uh, £4.7 billion of that uh, was for affordable housing, uh, producing some in, in the region of around 30,000 uh, affordable homes. Uh, Section 106 is um, uh, criticised uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's come under a, a lot of criticism for being uncertain uh, and opaque, uh, as is uh, viability. Uh, the SIL, uh, again, has come uh, under some criticism because of its flat rate and uh, uh, non-negotiable. Um, uh, status, but apparently it's welcomed by local planning authorities and developers because of its certainty. Uh, I have to admit, still is one of is one of those things that the government has decided to almost amend every single year uh, since it's come into um, force, and um, it's been um, it's been difficult at best, certainly in the initial stages uh, of dealing with that. Uh, that legislation uh, and what the government were trying to do and certainly the uptake from uh, local authorities uh, hasn't been total. Uh, next slide please. So um, what's the government's plan? Well they want to bring forward uh, reforms to ensure that what contributions we get from developers are responsive to um, local needs which brought me to the question of well, aren't they at the moment? I mean, we have uh, policies. Uh, we certainly look at each development as it comes forward, each application, and we determine each application. Uh, and we have consultation with the county. We have consultations with our colleagues uh, as to what impact this development uh, would have. Uh, and certainly, uh, developer contributions uh, as a result of that are um, assessed and looked at as being responsive to the local needs in light of the development that's coming forward. Uh, they also want them to be transparent. Um, so they want people to understand what actually is coming forward for their area as a result of the development. Consistent and simplified. Consistent Yes, but again, uh, each development is, is rather particular on its facts. Each application has to be determined um, b before each local authority. So we are consistent as local planning authorities, certainly the work I do for local planning authorities in terms of our um, policies, in terms of our requirements, uh, and a lot of the 106s that I do and, and uh, my colleagues do for local authorities are based on a consistent um, uh, approach. Uh, they want developer contributions to be buoyant. They want them to move up and down um, with, with market conditions. And, and I, I think that's that's a good idea uh, and capturing um, the land value through the grant of planning permission. Um, 
I think that is a very useful uh, thing. And certainly with regards to when we're dealing with Section 106 agreements and developer contributions, um, we will try via uh, having a uh, per dwelling figure for um, contributions to try and make them uh, as buoyant as we can. But, but I can certainly see capturing the land value as a result of um, planning permission to be um, something uh, useful uh, for us uh, and for the uh, the local needs as a result of the development to capture. Could I have the next slide please? So what's wrong with section 106 and SIL? Apparently 80% of local planning authorities feel that section 106 has creates delay. Um, there is a suggestion that section 106s are uncertain, uh, there is delay, they are costly, there are issues with regards to the skills in negotiation. Now, taking section 106 in itself, in terms of its uncertainty, uh, and certainly I, I deal with a lot of instructions, a lot of the uncertainty and a lot of the possible delay uh, and cost uh, comes from not necessarily the, the kind of headline figures for the 106, i.e. how much money uh, for a particular piece of infrastructure, let's say education, libraries, highways, um, you will tend to already know from the consultation response exactly what sort of levels uh, you're looking for, possibly on a per dwelling figure, possibly on a, a round figure uh, that, has, that has resulted from that consultation. What, what tends to cause the delay are well, two things really. Firstly, in terms of the triggers for the 106, um, these are an issue because uh, a lot of developers and a lot of local authorities know or tend to know exactly what figures they're dealing with for the contributions. But when it comes to when those contributions are required or when the open space uh, is required to be transferred, there tends to be um, a long period of negotiation on exactly when certain contributions or the open space is to be delivered. That then uh, tends to cause delay and then of course increases costs um, accordingly. So I'm not, I'm not sure that saying section 106 is in themselves creates delay is the problem. Sometimes you'll go to planning committee with your section 106 uh, headlines in terms of exactly what money is required or contributions are required. But what I rarely see is uh, triggers for those and the triggers do end up in, in a, a significant amount of uh, negotiation time. Uh, still, uh, it's been classed as inflexible and because of the early payment and um, local authorities are not spending the seal on um, future or future infrastructure. And, and that is a problem because obviously uh, local authorities will have their regulation uh, one, two, three list of the items of which they're going to spend their um, uh, seal on. And some are very detailed in terms of project names uh, and some are, are a little more vague, but um, I'm, I'm not the greatest fan of SIL personally, but um, and certainly something that's been amended almost every year since it's come into force uh, does does raise questions. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so, uh, what are we, what are they proposing? Um, a consolidated infrastructure levy, Section 106, apparently. Um, according to certain headlines, uh, is to be abolished. Uh, and really, what would be lost from that? We would, I think we would lose the ability to take each application on its facts and determine uh, the relevant or appropriate uh, contributions that are required and to deal with a specific site. And also, Section 106 is not all about money. It, it is, um, as I'll refer to, uh, further on uh, about delivery of, uh, of other things. So they want to replace it with uh, the infrastructure levy, which uh, suggested to be nationally set. Although they then go on and, and talk about an optional adoption of the uh, infrastructure levy, but 
then say, well, of course, section 106 will be gone. So uh, how are you going to get that money um, other than by the infrastructure levy, seal or by section 106? And if we've got rid of seal and uh, section 106 and you don't adopt infrastructure levy, well, uh, where, does, where does that take you? So I think you're kind of forced into a corner. It's a bit like when seal first came out, they tried to force um, local, local planning authorities to adopt uh, uh, SIL, uh, and they would do their best to try and get everybody to to adopt it. So, how would uh, the infrastructure levy deal with on-site delivery, delivery of uh, affordable housing, delivery of open space, etc.? Um, because how the government have approached this is they're saying, well, Section 106 is all about a sum of money. They're all about a uh, contribution towards uh, infrastructure. It, it's all money. Why else would it be there? Conditions deal with uh, planning conditions deal with other elements, but um, Section 106 is here to deal with money. But Section 106 doesn't just deal with money, uh, as I've said. Um, you know, the very common aspect of a Section 106 is uh, the delivery of the open space um, in, in accordance with the scheme, and then the adoption of that um, open space by a management company, for example, or the parish or the Cancel at a various trigger or a triggers in the development itself. Footnote 16 gives some um, very well, gives a very useful hint, and certainly this has been picked up by some commentators, um, saying that it could remain an option to deal with, or it is an option to deal with covenants on the land, as I say. So I, I honestly don't believe and I've certainly listened to quite a few webinars on the white paper um, and they're not going to get rid of section 106 what they're going to say in effect is the infrastructure levy is to deal with all the financial uh, aspects uh, that we usually would have in a section 106 agreement uh, and uh, other elements are going to uh, be dealt with as possible uh, within a section 106 agreement so we're not going to lose them but they're not going to disappear uh, which then takes me back to the original point about local authorities saying or everybody suggesting they cause delay and uncertainty were well, you just suggesting a system a new system called the infrastructure levy which is a takeover of section 106 and seal but that's just to deal with the cash side of things that's to deal with the, the contribution side of things um, you know there are other elements uh, the 106 deals with and, and I have to question um, uh, uh, how they're gonna or who when they looked at this who had this significant experience about drafting section 106 as for local authorities um, uh, the, I've, I've mentioned further down that the new system will uh, be charged uh, and these are the points from the white paper um, uh, on the final value of the development, levied at the point of occupation, include uh, a value based minimum threshold to which the levy is not charged, therefore trying to promote smaller uh, developments or infill developments as where they can, and provide greater certainty for communities about the levels of contribution um, set along uh, or set alongside the new development. Next slide, please. Uh, so forward funding. Um, just a brief point about forward funding here. This is going to allow local authorities to borrow against the infrastructure levy for um, forward uh, fund infrastructure. Now, I have to admit, um, this has always been a difficult one. It's been a difficult one for local authorities in general. Uh, should they should they borrow uh, against uh, or should they borrow generally uh, in terms of providing uh, future or forward funded infrastructure. A very difficult one. Local authorities are going to have to be very careful with that one because, again, what about if development doesn't come forward? Um, that can cause some real issues and headaches for local authorities, certainly in times when we haven't got much money in the first place, um, especially if you're forward funding something which is quite significant. Um, there'll be a worry uh, when, when the development uh, is going to come forward so that the infrastructure concerned is, go is going to be uh, necessary, as they say. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, the, the scope is really also to catch permitted development. So your um, offers to resi schemes, uh, there'll be an exemption uh, for self and custom build, uh, which in my, in my view was expected. Um, and there'll be the ability to possibly secure some more affordable housing. Um, because as, as they say, you can't spend still on affordable housing at the moment. Um, but you're going to be able to spend the infrastructure levy on that. There's also some uh, provision within there for in-kind delivery of affordable housing, and I put it there on the slide, um, so that um, you can kind of get a discount on your uh, levy, uh, depending on how much affordable housing uh, you provide. And, and I'd like to see how that one pans out. Um, I think that's an interesting one and certainly looking for developers to provide more affordable housing. And I think we need uh, more affordable housing uh, uh, in general. Um, and local authorities can accept infrastructure levy payments in the form of land or uh, uh, within or adjacent to the site. This gives local authorities an, an ability to put money or to build their own aff affordable housing. Uh, as the case may be. That's an interesting one. And I'd like to see more detail on that affordable housing because I think there's a lot of very uh, wide commentary on, on this and, and I'd like to see some more detail. Could I have the next slide, please? So uh, what can we spend the infrastructure on? Well, neighbor, looks like neighborhood plan areas are gonna keep the 25% as they uh, do with uh, SIL. Uh, of course, there's got to be a strong link between development, where it occurs and, and where the money is spent. Um, we could focus uh, on the infrastructure and affordable housing, but apparently it could be used uh, if there's some left over or local authority considers um, on council tax. So there's going to be some flexibility there, and, and I like that flexibility, and I think that's very important for local authorities to have flexibility. There are too many constraints in what can and what can't be spent, uh, and that certainly is from 106s and from SIL, in my view. Uh, it tends to be very restrictive, and there needs to be some freedom, uh, as long as it is obviously spent where the development occurs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, kind of almost my my last slide with regards to this stronger enforcement i'm i'm i've had a lot of experience with enforcement over the years and certainly enforcement cases that have gone on for in excess of 10 years uh backwards and forwards through the courts uh on technicalities um and and i always thought enforcement needs to be stronger it really doesn't have any teeth um and I, and I I really feel for local authorities I work for dealing with enforcement because it it, it just feels like if somebody can appeal uh, you, you the, the appeal get kicked into long grass um, you know you've got somebody on site potentially continuing the same breach because they've appealed it for another year uh, I, I get this um, proceeds of crime. But but that's when the enforcement notice comes into force. So there are some there are some real tidying up uh, opportunities here for the government to put some real teeth on enforcement. And I think from what everybody has said today, I think if you're going to have this new system, I think uh, you need to have strong enforcement and certainly stronger than we got. So even if this doesn't all come forward, uh, I would really hope that they put some teeth on enforcement. Um, there's also a question of what can be done where the environment agency's flood risk advice on planning is not followed. Again, we've all had developments where it's new development and suddenly it floods. Um, uh, and you know there are issues with um, the drainage, uh, other issues on site, and, and sometimes where the environment agency or local lead flood authorities advice hasn't been followed or hasn't take, been taken through to conditions. And we end up with a real mess on site. It tends to be political, it tends to get members involved and it gets very nasty. And it's all up to us uh, within a local authority, situ um, local authority uh, situation to sort out. It, it's not the place to do it. Um, so I'm very grateful that they've added uh, something in there and, and I hope that gets addressed. 
Uh, next slide, please. So um, I, just before this slide, which is um, for uh, Tom uh, Newcomb to go through, uh, it's a bit of a canter through pillar three, but I think there's some very interesting points that come through. And um, I urge you all to respond to the consultation uh, and specifically with regards to section 106s uh, and affordable housing, because I think there's opportunities there. And I would suggest that the enforcement team or your enforcement officers really do play on the issues uh, of stronger enforcement and also flooding as well. I, I think those are important areas uh, and, and the government needs to get on top of them and they need your input. Your input is the most important thing. But one headline from what I've said today is, I honestly don't believe section 106s are going anywhere uh, and they will still remain. So I will pass you over to Tom for a summary. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, um, and uh, thank you also to William and Deborah. Um, uh, if in the background we could have the other presenters up on screen as well, that would be helpful. Um, we've had lots of uh, really excellent um, questions and comments that have been that have been uh, coming through to me over the over the course of the last uh, hour and a, hour and a half or so. Um, some of the questions actually are almost unanswerable, and some of them I can I can sort of wrap up a, a bit like Steve just has in terms of. This question about Section 106 and whether it will or will not go away, what I would urge everybody to do is to look at both the uh, consultation for changes to the current system and also the white paper and, and make your comments known on this. So, for example, in relation to this, this point about SMEs and whether that might include 40 or 50 houses being exempt from, from uh, Section 106, certainly in terms of affordable housing, I would urge you to make your comments known. Likewise, uh, the pillar three that Steve's just been through, um, there is a lot of uncertainty as to as to uh, what this actually means. There are various paragraphs and phrases used which suggest the absolute abolition of Section 106, and indeed, uh, the Secretary of State and the Housing Minister have both been on uh, the radio and television in the last few weeks declaring the end of Section 106, when of course the reality is we all know for various reasons, including uh, pillar two aspects, including uh, you know the, the various elements of on-site uh, delivery of infrastructure, that it's just simply not practical or possible to get rid of section 106, nor indeed do, do we think it's wise. So make your make your comments known. Um, local authority resourcing. There are references throughout the white paper, in particular, to resourcing, um, but I think it's probably fair to say that. Um, it, it actually, when it comes to it, it is, it is unclear, with the exception of the infrastructure levy, which is supposed to go to, to, national, uh, to local authorities, how, when you consider what William was talking about in relation to zoning, when you consider what Deborah's been talking about in relation to design codes, and what Steve's been talking about in relation to uh, infrastructure, then you've got technical details, consent associated with permission in principle, neighbourhood planning, which we'll come on to in a second, prior approvals and the complexities around permitted development, where all of this uh, resourcing or where, where resourcing is supposed to actually be going. And so, um, you know, there's lots of references into the, into the, in the white paper um, about comprehensive skills strategies, uh, about planning fees being set at uh, national level. Um, but ultimately, um, we're talking about um, effectively a, a, a sort of a rebasing at uh, local planning authority resourcing level where are resources going to be diverted are funds are, are funds going to have to be diverted towards new elements of the planning system without necessarily losing old elements of it which are hugely time consuming so um moving on to some questions and i've done my best to sort of try and amalgamate these as we've been going through and there, as i say there have been a, a, a fantastic amount of questions that have been raised um William, perhaps one for you to, to kick us off, although I'm sure others might want to chip in. But in relation to zoning, um, and I'm going to call it zoning, I know we're not supposed to, but let's face it, it, it is zoning. <laughs> Local planning authorities are going to have to put in an awful lot of work to get this right. The first question is, is this going to speed things up? What community participation is going to be involved? 
and is that in any way realistic? And then uh, what is the impact going to be on conservation areas? And how is this going to work in practice? How do you see your time being spent over the next 10 years in relation to local plan inquiries in this, in this context? Uh, thank you, Tom. There's quite a lot in that. Obviously, the, <laughs> the idea is there's an awful lot of work now and if you're looking 10 years ahead, it's somehow a lot simpler. You'll have these plans to refer to and design codes to refer to, sort of look up system almost, and uh, are even thinking sort of machine readable system that will allow most people to know exactly what they need to do. But how we get to that nirvana in 10 years time is that's the problem. I think that I've always thought that zoning had been uh, off the table because it is so resource hungry to get it in place. Uh, and then we had a system that had such a history that we thought changing you know, the super tanker around was really going to be very difficult. But I mean, taking your more detailed points, I mean, they, yes, in theory, it's more severe up once we get there. But the actual involvement of the community, they're saying, oh, let's use digital platforms and you know, try and get people, younger people in particular, involved um, and sort of throwing it out there as to how to do it without really any template in place. But of course, there are certain things that do stay in place. I mean, conservation areas, in theory, still remain as effective as they are now. And they are areas of uh, restraint. And um, in a very familiar system, someone wants to develop, in theory, they have to go through the process of making a planning application, though design codes, I think, would be uh, more important in those areas as well. So it, I've heard of using the word zoning because it's not like a system one can find anywhere else. It's not zoning as anyone knows it um anywhere actually but we may end there um because you can look at a plan and it has nice colors on it and you can see my particular plot of land has these particular um colorings on it or restraints on it and that's the idea is that it's if you lived in the netherlands you could apparently could look at your particular block and know how many stories it's allowed to have and how far back from the street it has to be uh, and those sort of things which we of course um can't give the definite answer to in our system. But I know the others may have some comments as well about um, where they think this wonderful system is going to really be speeded up. Well, my, mm. my feeling about the consultation thing is it's going to take a major change in public sort of approach to local planning to get the general public really engaged in the local plan process. It's very early in the um, a whole system of, of a house or a development appearing behind you for, for people to get engaged. People have been used to seeing an application going for something that they can really visualise and that's the point at which they want to mm. comment. We all know that um, people get home from work, they find a letter saying the local plan's being produced, you want to comment and it goes to one side and they make the tea. Um, you, you do get more engaged when it says there's going to be a house built behind, in the field behind you. Mm. So it's going to be real hard work I think for local authorities to actually get people to understand what the local planning system is about and to get um, engaged beyond those real interest groups that are engaged at the moment. Um, and I'm not sure that saying it's got to be done in 30 months is going to make the decision making process better. It may be quicker, mm. but I'm not sure it's going to be better. And when you bear in mind how much more significant it's going to be to be for the site to be allocated. Uh, and to follow on for that, um, Deborah, in relation to environmental impact assessment and in relation mm. to uh, design guides, how, if, if at all possible, can that fit in to this, um, this, this strategy towards sort of front loading the system to create a much faster post plan development? How is that going to be possible? Who is going to be dealing with uh, environmental impact assessment at that stage and the design uh, codes? Yeah. Well, it's a very interesting question because it, it seems to me that in a growth area in particular where allocation is going to effectively, in my mind, mean planning permission has been granted, you will have to have done an environmental impact assessment if you're going to protect areas of um, value and environmental um, qualities and so on. Um, so that will have to be done in reasonable detail before that site is allocated. If there's a developer or promoter promoting it, there's a fair chance that in practice they'll produce that information for the local authority to um, deal with. If there isn't, if it's a more um, conceptual sort of um, decision to make it into part of a growth area, then um, somehow the local planning authority is going to have to do it. 
one of my big concerns is at the moment when you deal with environmental impact assessment in applications there comes a time when your your um, environmental assessment is too old and has to be renewed so what's going to happen between the site being in the growth area and it actually coming forward to development um, is there going to be another need to do another impact assessment before actually going on to the next stage because more time it's, it's a little bit it's 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 a little bit just misleading because at the moment you'd have an outline and then a, a reserve map there'd be a delay but there's going to be potentially more delay between effectively getting your first planning consent by being allocated and actually coming forward development so i do think it's an area which they were right to kick the can down the road in because it is tricky beyond a doubt uh, and design codes are going to have to be produced at the same time. I suspect those being produced for areas um, in growth areas just being put forward for development non-specifically will be fairly high level. They'll be about densities and general broad layouts uh, access rather than very detailed and they'll get more detailed as the process proceeds. Thank you. And, and Steve, we, we, we think the, uh, the consultation that is out sort of now will, uh, whilst it may completely remove affordable housing from small sites um, will allow uh, the current system of uh, infrastructure levy potentially although there is reference to uh, that may be eased off for smaller sites but infrastructure levy in section 106 to continue in relation to other aspects for the time being potentially for a period of maybe 18 months beyond that though and we've got quite a few county councils on on this call as well what is going to happen in relation to county council uh, contributions, if I can call it like that, in, with this new proposed world of world of uh, infrastructure levy, and then perhaps a slightly scaled back section 106. Do do we know? Well, that's an interesting one, and that's something that SIL didn't really deal with in in, in the first place when when that initially came out, and certainly the monies uh, raised by SIL um, uh, should filter their way back to a county council for education, highways, and libraries in the usual way. Um, but because of the uh, infrastructure lists, the 123 list, uh, you found that not a lot of those actually went back to county. And of course, county councils were saying at the time, well, so you don't want any education, you don't want any libraries, and you don't really want any highways. So that, that's fine. Um, I, I think it's going to be a very difficult one. And, and again, it, it, it's an issue that I hope they address as part of this consultation on the infrastructure levy. Um, it doesn't seem to address the county. It talks about money, and, and I assume this money is going to be paid uh, directly to the local planning authority, uh, and it'll be up to the local planning authority to, to then distribute it to the county. Um, that, that hasn't really worked in my experience with SIL, and I would struggle to think they're going to address it again as part of this uh, infrastructure uh, levy or this consultation and I would absolutely urge county councils uh, and uh, highway officers uh, education and libraries to make those points as part of the consultation in response and specifically refer to the SIL as well. Just going back to design guides Deborah, um, the, and, and I suppose this ties in with, a, with quite a few questions we've had in relation to neighbourhood planning, but there are elements to this white paper that seem uh, very top down, very sort of nationalistic. And then there are elements to this that seem to go even further than the current sort of localism agenda, which is the potential to have, I think I'm right in saying, neighbourhood plans down to a, an almost street level. Yes, one street. Yeah. One street. And design guides similarly at an extremely local level where is where is the expertise for this going to come from is, is this is this the potential for developers to step in and and reach an agreement with with locals to produce one for them is that the way we might go well it does seem likely um the behavior of developers to date has been to try and get involved in these processes with the perfectly sensible motivation that they want the outcome to be something that's workable for them because um, it, it certainly is possible, I would think, to have whole layers of design code. I think the in intention is that they mm. will be at a district-wide level. I don't think the intention is that they'll be at a county-wide level, but I, it may be. I, I just haven't really addressed that in my own mind. Um, but I think that then um, the district-wide one will probably be fairly 
broad brush in its um, scope and then you might get down to more local ones getting more and more detailed for more and more um, precise locations so that in the end you do perhaps have a in this street we'll have um, houses set back by so many meters and facades that are so no, no higher than this and those sorts of things uh, and down to materials um, but I think one of the problems is going to be uh, trying to get the appropriate level of detail in there because you will get some if you have community involvement you'll get some people wanting to be really really prescriptive about what they will accept in their area um, mm -hmm. and that's then going to be problematic for developers in practice yeah can because i, I think come on, you know, hmm. there's right, one of the things they seem to stress is that there has to be community involvement in the adoption of these design codes they don't really say how but they do say unless there is community involvement these design codes should not be given weight and you think that's going to be interesting trying to achieve that because I can think it's not like the Kent design guide across Kent is some authorities adopt a supplementary guide and some don't and just see it as interesting help. But design has always been a, a broader thing and I suppose that's where the smaller developers find it quite a problem because they're not given much of a steer. Whereas the bigger developers obviously have huge design teams and their own pattern books uh, to work from. And I suppose the idea is that we will end up with the system well, they hope is more predictable about what people will accept and there there is comes back to that wonderful building beautiful um, commission that they thought if we produce beautiful buildings people will have, will support development um i suppose that's the kind of goal that they're hoping for that if everyone signs up to it then we'll all be welcoming the additional levels of development now needed but certainly a big a big improvement on where we are at the moment where there isn't this sort of clear uh, steer towards good design uh, in terms of what could be refused. And certainly on permitted development rights, there is absolutely no control um, at that level. And if you combine permitted development rights with a design code, which seems to be partly what's involved, they're hoping that everything um, becomes more acceptable uh, generally. But um, I can't at the moment, I suppose, point to a design code. I don't know if there is uh, one that has a set of rules that produces good design. It seems to me there's still too much judgment, but maybe I'm a too pessimistic. Um. But do you think, William, that this is um, design codes uh, are, are likely to lead to greater variety and greater reflection of local character, or are they likely to lead to a more standardised development across the country? I do fear the latter myself. I can see the problem because unless you've adopted something locally and had the local buy-in, then your the default is some nationalised design code. Um, and that local buy-in is going to take a lot of time, a lot of resource. Yeah, and as you say, unless the developers are funding it, I don't know how we suddenly go from where we are at the moment to this wonderfully resourced uh, design team. What about on a, on a sort of a similar theme, and I'll, I'll just throw this out there, but there's a, there's a lack in, in the white paper of um, the detail as to what sanctions would actually be imposed on a local planning authority for failing to get their plan in place. Uh, what do we think the government is, is referring to there? I mean, the local plan. Yeah, the, the idea if you don't meet your 30 months, what happens next? And yeah, they don't don't really specify it. The only power at the moment is that of intervention, which they've very rarely used. Um, and this time we'll say, well, if we don't meet the deadline, what do, do we have some standardized design imposed on an area? I don't see how that fits sustainability credentials. Um, so it's it's difficult to see what the sanction is meant to be, unless there might be some funding issue or um, the sort of, I suppose, planning by appeal. I don't know if anyone else has got a view about what what magic bullet they think they have in mind. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I assume it's a, it's some, form financial, uh, it's some form of financial penalty of some form. I, I just don't know. It, it's not clear. It's very, very, very trouble, not clear. The, the trouble is you, you surely have to put um, quality and sustainability of development above punishing a local authority financially, and the two are somewhat inconsistent. You, you still mm. need good quality decision making. Yeah, it very so, much worries me with these, as you say, the environmental impact assessment requirements um, and these growth areas are, almost ends up being a series of mini appeals as part of the planning inquiry in the, in the old style system. So how we, the new style system, get that all done within nine months and apparently no stage allowed for modifications and sort of the flexibility the current system has, uh, it's going to be very tricky. 
we're, we're, we're probably in danger of um, being our usual sort of cynical lawyers selves. But um, if I could ask each of you to, to pick one element of of the of the white paper and indeed let's let's widen it out to the consultation for the current system that, that you think is a good idea and and people perhaps should vote for if i can put it like that uh, what would you suggest deborah do you want to venture something first well i think it's certainly a good idea to aim for beautiful places and sustainable development um, and i do think that there is um a good deal to be said for design codes, local design codes that can get development to be reflecting local character. Um, I, I just think that there's, it is difficult to achieve that in a practice, but as an idea, I, I do like it. Mm -hmm. um, William? I suppose the positive would be if we can get more uh, data and more sort of ability to have people to see things online, it's been a huge advantage the amount that has been done already. Uh, so I can see that that shift and hopefully resources to go with it to make things much more accessible uh, and I suppose yes, web-based will help. Um, so I can see that is a positive. Right, and Steve? Uh, I like the idea that they're possibly going to get rid of SIL. Um, it's a pain <laughs> in the neck. But I also like the ability for the uh, infrastructure levy to then, uh, for a local authority, to have some freedom in which it's going to be spent. Uh, I like that flexibility. I think it's been too constrained in the past uh, for particular developments, and uh, uh, I've I've struggled with that. I really have. So I I I think that's a great idea. Okay. Well, uh, we are um, we're we're pretty much out of time. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you um, uh, for joining us today, and to thank our three speakers, Deborah, Stephen, and William. Uh, for hopefully what you've all found is, uh, really informative presentations. I appreciate there's an awful lot to take in and some of you, certainly judging from some of the questions we've had, have got a real, real uh, good handle on this. Others of you may still yet need to spend the weekend reading through this. Um, our slides hopefully will help, so we will be sending those out to all of you uh, for you to look at afterwards. And again, to reiterate the message, uh, we're here to assist you and um, in any way we can. So please do get in contact. Um, we are on the local government procurement framework, so we are able to provide uh, legal advice for you without necessarily needing to go through complex procurement procedures. So please do bear that in mind. Uh, and so um, all that remains is to thank you once again for uh, joining us. Please do provide us with any feedback that you can. Thank you for your questions. And we look forward to uh, speaking with you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.